real-life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Now is the time to stand up and speak out. At Humanity Against Violence, we are uniting survivors, organizations, and communities to create change. Welcome to our podcasts and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Our videos are for information purposes only and any accusations are alleged and less found guilty in a court of law. Let the show begin. Hey everyone, I am here with a guest. I have Layla with us and y'all, the things that go on in America today are just crazy and unacceptable. Uh, the story will blow your mind. How are you doing today, Layla? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm looking forward to talking to you. It's a uh, really, really heartbreaking what they're doing to you. Yeah, it's, it's been, it's been really difficult over the course of, if you, I guess you want to say eight years <clears throat> when it all began. So, so um, what is it? Take us back then, you know, eight years ago and tell us what, what happened, what started all of this. Um, approximately eight years ago, I had, um, decided to speak up and escape domestic violence. And um, it's been pretty much trial and error since then. I don't know exactly where to start. It's kind of hard to start. Um, there's a lot of ups and downs that go with that emotionally and, and things like that. So I had met someone in approximately around 2012. I had met him and um, I thought he was the cream of the crop and I thought he was amazing. He liked my children. He seemed to have liked my children and, and we fell pretty fast. and. About a year later, um, I invited him into my home to, to live with us. And um, some signs and stuff started happening not too long after that. So when was the first time that you noticed he wasn't who you thought he was? Um, he and I had gone to a gas station. And my children and I went to a gas station. And um, I, he had parked my car. I always let him drive my car. And he had parked my car up in front of the front door of the gas station because my children were hungry and they needed to uh, take a restroom break. And um, unfortunately, so, uh, someone had parked up uh, against next to us um, and had gotten out of the car and accidentally tapped their car door on my car. And um, he had gone in and, you know, we took all the children in to go do what they needed to do inside of the the gas station and came back out and the couple next to us was still there and he got into the driver's side and decided that um, as soon as they got into their car he was going to purposely take my car door and slam it up against theirs <clears throat> and i knew that was a problem wow. yeah and, that's a little harsh <laughs> and i you know and i kind of froze a little bit and i wasn't sure exactly how to handle it but i i did remind him that there are kids in the car and that wasn't probably the best way to go and so oh, that anger, that's, that's a lot of anger to show. So before that he didn't show any, he, he was just great and wonderful still. huh? Right. And, and they're like that too. They're very manipulative like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the other things were, you know, like I think our first holiday together, we were at his folks house and my son at one of my sons at the time was pretty young and excited and if you know anything about kids they a new person and someone to give them attention to they kind of jump around and and end up with a little extra energy and and stuff when that person's there and unfortunately he didn't want that attention i guess didn't didn't necessarily show signs right away that he didn't want my son climbing on him and things like that and somewhere in there he proceeded to uh, squish my ch my son um, in between the couch and his back and did it pretty hard <laughs> and we'll let him out and he couldn't breathe and and that was like the second warning <clears throat> and i try to chalk it up as that he you know he doesn't have kids he 
doesn't know how it goes and you know didn't know how to gauge when to tell him to stop and to settle down well having somebody turn from being the perfect man of your dreams to all of a sudden becoming this monster is just it's something that you don't see you don't see it coming you know and, and it's subtle too it's, it's usually you know just little things that you know it, it develops and grows and, and gets worse and most victims make excuses for the abusers first going into it cause you just don't expect it and think oh well maybe it's just an off day or or there's some sort of miscommunication or misunderstanding that's what it has to be so i, I definitely understand that right so what did your family think of him did your family and friends like him um honestly my parents did not and they based it on how he was would act in public places like for instance there was a time that we had gone out to dinner and he decided to kind of cross some boundaries and manners and, and things and kind of do little little things that I didn't think were a big deal. And I thought he was being playful with my kids, but um, it wasn't appropriate. Like like things like starting a food fight at the dinner table, or um, there were times we had holiday gatherings and he, he and I um, would be completely stressed out because he didn't, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It's like they create this chaos and the stress before even going anywhere to any type of function. It could be holidays. It could be birthdays. It could be um, just even sometimes going to the grocery store. There has to be some type of major catastrophe before before even going. So, you know, especially when it came to birthdays and holidays and and. and and all of that and when it's already stressful in the first place they make it extra stressful absolutely yeah, my ex was the same way that's that's crazy that you say that i wonder if there's what the the connection and correlation is with that because i've i've heard that a lot and i experienced that as well i think so, it's, if i were to guess it has to do with the attention's not on them yeah it, seems like, it seems like that if if the attention isn't something that's either their idea or directed to them to have that attention um, and it's diverted into something else, um, that's that's where it comes in. It's kind of like, yeah. almost like a jealousy factor, maybe. Right, yeah. right. So yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So what so uh, so what happened when you finally were, were brave and started speaking out? Were you able to get safe? Um, when I first started speaking out, actually, it took it took a lot of time to do that because it got to the point where I only could talk to maybe two people out of several of my friends. And even then, it was as if I was being just gradually alienated from my own family and, and, and my lifelong friendships. I've had friendships for 30, 40 years, and and uh, I got to the point where I wasn't calling anyone anymore. Got to the point if I did call, he would eavesdrop on my phone conversations, or if I started to be talking about some of the stress that's going on, he would come and grab the phone and take the phone and and toss the phone, you know, or uh, or if I if I talk, it's it's after the phone call, and he would. Um, I'd have repercussions after that. And more or less, it would be my children that would have repercussions after that. Because if I spoke, my children got the consequences, more or less. And that was his way of punishing me to keep me quiet. It's that isolation. They have to be able to completely isolate you so they have that power and control. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened uh, when you did finally leave? Um, it probably took about nine or ten times of having him removed from my home. And and I know that takes quite a few times for a lot of people. Historically, I, I've, I've read on that. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's, it's very difficult to get away from an abuser. They make it, they make it, you know, obviously as difficult as they possibly can. And then when you have a system that doesn't want to do anything to help victims, I mean, your options are pretty limited. Right, right. So, um, so about eight years ago, 
I, I had a son and um, that was right, right about, it was 2015 when he was born. Actually, prior to him being born, he had um, had his first arrest and stuff from our house after second to the last time before he was completely removed from from my home. He had uh, committed some harm on on my youngest son at the time, who was eight years old at the time. I have um, more than one child that he inflicted harm upon. But um, on this one, he had um, no problem with doing a lot of physical things to him at eight years old. And he, in that morning, my son had wanted my attention like he always did before going off to school. He usually would come in and, and snuggle with me before school and, you know, do the typical I love you's and stuff before going. And apparently uh, the, that time he did not like it and got up out of bed and trotted down the hallway and went after him. and picked him up off the ground and my son had a, a bunk bed in his room so that's a pretty tall or you know going from the ground up that's pretty high up and oh, to, yeah, sure. to bring someone by their throat to pick him up that way to to do what he did he tried to smother him on the top bunk with the pillow and and kind of did things like spit on his pillow and told him he was disrespectful and just all this stuff and it, and it made a big mess of the morning for my son we ended up being like two hours late for school. I didn't know exactly what to do. And I remember being afraid to take my son to school. And I remember um, just deciding finally I was going to take him to school. And I sat in front of the police department. It was a little town. So the police department was just, a, you know, down the road from my house and sat in front of there. The doors weren't even open yet and nobody was there yet. And then since the doors weren't open, I took him to school and talked to his teachers and let them know that something happened today and I expect that he should talk and if he wanted to talk he could talk about it I had no problem and and they knew I was going to do something about it and and then I went back and and sat in front of the station they told me to, to sit there until they opened up the doors and I went in and talked to the chief of police and told him the incident and what happened there and he locked me in his office and he went to the house and tried to go in and and he wouldn't answer the door and then i received a phone call while i was sitting at the police department and they asked if they could enter my home and i said yes you can enter my home and apparently they took him out of the shower and they did it by gunpoint to take him out the house was still scattered and a mess there were a lot of things broken all over the house and unfinished that he had broken the night before as i was sitting at the police station and as he was being carted off to to jail um he had no problem sending text messages and calling me names and stuff on the text messages. His biggest one was that I'm a, I'm, I'm psycho and I'm, I'm crazy and no one's going to believe me and all that kind of stuff. Your um, infamous gaslighting tricks. Mm -hmm, for sure. And then, um, so he was arrested. That was his first arrest out of all of that. It's really hard to put things all in order in, in time in exact time frame because there was so much it was going on for a long time and it was a lot of it and it's really intense but that was the arrest and then i ended up getting an emergency no abuse contact order he ended up pleading what did they call the fifth and no contest. yes pleading the fifth is what he calls it yeah. because you know it sounds more dramatic that way, I guess. But um, so he did that. And I think one of his family members released him. He first had a kind of a stay, emergency stay away. And then we knocked it down to um, no abuse contact with the option of him to go to domestic violence courses before coming back home. And um, he basically went to an assessment, went to a couple of meetings. Of course, I paid for it. I drove him there and um, he had decided at some point that that's not for him and he's not one of them. And you put off the responsibility and ownership of that and stopped going. And I still, because I was pregnant with my son, um, I invited him back, back home thinking that there was progress being made and, and stuff. And, and there really wasn't, he ended up, doing more more harm to my children and 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 myself you know too i mean mentally and emotionally it really really put me back 
I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to, what was the safest way to deal with this. I was pregnant and I was having empathy because I was his first child. I wanted him to see his first child be born and for him to be there for that. I mean, he was, even with a no abuse order, he still would be abusive. He still would say certain phrases and, and question certain things to make you doubt yourself. Like, for example, I had to do, I had to have a C-section for my son. And I, before you have to do surgery, you have to go see the surgeon and prepare for that. And even in the office, you know, the doctor would ask me a question and then he would turn around and say the opposite of what my answer is and, and question, are you sure about that? Are you sure? And just really in a, in a, in a tone that was really, I don't even know. I don't Dismissive even know. of, of <laughs> what you wanted. Yeah, it was very creepy, honestly. But it, de it definitely um, had you question yourself. And then at the same time, I just stuck stuck to it. So that that was difficult. Um, prior to my son being born, there were two or three other babies that had passed. And um, they were his. And um, they had passed because he knew I was high risk. And he knew how to stress me out enough to to make that happen. So there was just just a lot of stuff going into that. <clears throat> I don't think he wanted our son. Actually, he even claimed he didn't want him. He wanted him to go away in so many words. Um, and you know, pretty much what I'm suggesting there. So, I mean, there were numerous times when I was pregnant, he would trap me in the basement and he would lock me in with a screwdriver down in the basement and he would terrorize me down there, back me up in the corner. There was a time he backed me up in the furnace area, which is a very small area. You know, furnaces and walls, they're pretty close yeah. together. And he backed me up in there. I had to one time, my saving grace was calling <laughs> the furnace repair guy that I had there working on the furnace one time just to kind of do a pretend call update on how the furnace is running because I didn't know what else to do. Just to... Yeah hopefully de-escalate it and, and keep me safe. Well, I mean, when you're, when you feel like you're in danger, you're desperate to try and do anything. And, you know, when you're dealing with somebody who you fully know what they are capable of and it's uh, nothing good. Right. You know, and, and you never know what they're going to do either. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So you had said before something that when we had talked before that while uh, your husband was arrested, um, they they never ended up uh, taking him in another time. They just dropped him off at the store up the road from you. What was that that same incident or was that? No, that later um, there were restraining orders issued. I had him removed for the last time out of out of my home. Um, and what triggered that for the last time was this was after my son was born and he was newborn and he had shook the baby. He was probably 10 days old and, and shook him hardcore because I was yelling for help. I have a, a sister too that was, that comes and I take care of, or she comes and hangs out and her uh, staff and group home call it, you know, camp at my house because she, you know. She's just awesome. I don't know. But um, he had inflicted harm on her as well for trying to defend me and stuff. Um, he did not like it when I screamed and yelled for help. And I was outdoors when that happened. He was trapping me in the doorway. He was trapping me on the sidewalk so I can get anywhere. And then he ended up vigorously shaking um, um, the newborn. And... Um, because I shouted out for help, he had threatened to smash my face and, and again shook shook my son really, really hard. It doesn't matter if they're in a car seat or in a stroller and they're newborn, their heads are never stable. Oh yeah, and for sure. Shaken baby syndrome and that caused uh, really serious person. brain damage. Yeah, there are side effects actually that he endured. Somehow it's kind of a blur, but he eventually took off. And then my sister and I and the kids ended up going to a safe space. I ended up talking with a couple of domestic violence places and got set up 
with victim services or whatever to start restraining orders and things like that. Technically, one of the places wanted me to get it done within that day, but they wanted me to get it done in two hours. And that's a little hard to do when you're doing it for five people. So you're doing it for four vulnerable children and, and yourself, and you're trying to tell the story for each one of them in, in separate ways. And that was really difficult. That took me quite a few days to get that done. Eventually, there was uh, the, the emergency orders after that w were granted, and then you wait for the court date for the next step. Um, they were granted for four years. It was really intense because it was, it was fresh and all the stuff was going on. And somewhere along the lines, there was, you know, he was having arguments and issues with the court about wanting to pick up his property from my house. And he didn't like the dates that were available. And the court gave him stipulations and dates to get it done. And he just wasn't pleased at all because it wasn't on his terms. Eventually, he was supposed to pick up that property. And he, um, had threatened my attorney and threatened the court that he would show up no matter what. And the court and the attorney had told them that if he were to do that, he would be picked up and arrested for violating the restraining orders and violating the court order. And, you know, knowing him and knowing that I know his patterns pretty well and I know when he's serious, I knew that he was going to follow through with that threat. It was the day after Christmas that he and a and a handful of people end up showing up at my at my home and to retrieve that without police backup none of that was you know he was supposed to be able to do that with the police there but he never did that um, apparently the police had told him that you know again the specific dates that were available and it wasn't good enough for him and so i scooped up my my kiddos and I went somewhere else and I had called 911 saying that he was there and I found out that at the same time the dispatcher said you know they had asked is this the address is this your name and she said we, we already have six phone calls on this so basically instead of the little city that county came and picked him up and from my understanding he was handcuffed and he was brought down to the little city grocery store, which is just down the block from, from the house. In that time, they only, I think, held him for an hour at the grocery store and then eventually just let him go. They never arrested him. They never did anything. After clearly they... violating a restraining order. Yes, and that county had no problem picking him up. And they were there to see it all go on. Did he get a, his property that day? Yes, I ended up giving permission for them just to get, you know, the, the property that I put outside out of there because I just didn't want to deal with it anymore. <laughs> and so the property was taken and, and taken care of, but um, he wasn't. As time went on, the police department brought it to the DA's office. The DA's office sat it on, on it for a couple of months. And I waited for a reply as to what's going on. And obviously he was free to be and do whatever he wanted and um, continue his, his terroristic threats and, and things like that. Upon me calling and asking what is going on and then the attorney asking the DA what is going on with it, um, I eventually found that uh, the DA, to them, beyond a reasonable doubt, there is no proof that he was um, violating those restraining orders. And and the neighbors that had called and all the other ones that have called had sent in videos and photographs of him and his and the people that he brought with him going through my entire yard taking photos and stuff of my home. It was all there. That's insane. So was it, was he ever prosecuted for any of this? No. That's just it just baffles me how many people can do some of the most despicable things mm -hmm. to to adults and children. I mean, there are, you know, there are children involved in your situation, which, you know, he is causing some detrimental harm to that they just ignore. Yep. I have four children and he physically harmed every single one of them. I have three of them with LD issues and developmental issues. And the first one who's now in his twenties, almost 30 at the time, he's with autism. 
you know, 20 plus years ago, they didn't have any way to help these kiddos emotionally regulate and he would in inflict a lot of harm on him or set him up to have meltdowns and, and, and fits and stuff. I mean, he had no problem popping bags around his ears to get him to fall to the ground in, in tears and screaming. He had no problem grabbing him in, in tossing him around the house and, and stuff. He, my oldest ended up with them. Um, kidney damage from what he did to him with the whole court process and the stuff what what happened with the court process and in, in regards to like did you have to have shared custody or how did that play out um so my youngest one is he's a he's adjudicated as the father um we had a case that he opened himself I like to say he sued himself to open up his own PA case. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. First, I had four-year restraining orders, five of them against him that were approved. And in the meantime, he was not respecting those orders and he was not respecting a few other things. I had an attorney that ended up on the case who believed and felt that I needed to increase those orders. And those orders were not even halfway over. We only got, I think, two years into those four-year orders and um, managed to upgrade those to 10 years. And on those 10-year restraining orders, um, it lists him as a person at risk for ending lives and a person at risk for committing other physical um, harm upon my children or I. So he is definitely noted and listed on those re restraining orders as, as that. And unfortunately, he was given some supervised visitation with the youngest one, even though he was found unfit and, 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 and dangerous to be around children. He was, was given that. Also, in between all of this, and at the same time, there was a TPR case that was hanging over his head. And we were going through a TPR case, TPR is Termination of Parental Right. And he met all of those requirements for that. He was found unfit. He was found dangerous. He was found, found incapable of taking responsibility and acknowledging his dangerous behavior as his problem. The judge had recognized that. But unfortunately, the 1% that says a child deserves to know who their parents are, that is what the reasoning was for not completing the TPR. Now I can backtrack and say, well, if I wasn't so scared back then, I could really open up and said, you know, judge i understand that and as a person myself who has experience with being adopted and turning 18 i understand a person can find you know their families if they wanted to but i didn't have that frame of mind back then and i was scared and and, and whatnot so the tpr being put on hold like that or closed at that time gave the court the window to okay him to to be able to be able to see him if he if he chose. I received full sole legal placement in custody. He was not able to receive custody. They were not going to allow him to do that. So what happened with the 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 visits then? They were supervised visits. Yeah, he had supervision for a little while, and then he misused the super supervision, and he started misusing it as as to seek advice from the advocates that were supervising my son. And my son was a baby at the time and he had no problems with stripping him down and trying to take photographs of him and things like that. And he was also at times would be sitting in front of the window when his godmother and I would, would drop him off and, and taking pictures of us pulling in, which is in violation of not the visitation place as well as the restraining orders. But that county didn't do anything about it. That state didn't do anything about it. Is that a threat to you? Is that a threat to harm to you? No. Now, did the the visitation uh, place that y'all went to, did they see this happening? Yeah, they, they were aware of it. And they did document that. But they, can, but they continued, you know, on with the day with, with him seeing him. Now, did they report it? No, because if that's a violation, then I mean, I assume, I mean, here in these uh, wonderful United States of America, I mean, I know they kind of pick and choose what laws to follow, but you know, I mean, if you're violating a protection order and or putting a child in danger and you work for the state, you're required to report things. I think one time an officer went in to talk to them about it. 
and I and I think that was it. That's and just that crazy. It, yeah. Yeah. So it's really sad all these organizations that have the power and ability to help children and you know help victims of violence and they make the choice not to. Right. Well, I think part of it too is they're also afraid. They oh, have for sure. their building and there's other children in that building. I'm sure. Well, then know. I mean, but then that should be your first sign. I mean, if you're dealing with an individual to where these professionals are afraid to work with, I mean, here's your sign, judges. Time to uh, stop putting people in a fearful position like that. Right. I mean, if grown adults and professionals feel like this, imagine how the kids must feel. Right. Right. And he's just little and he doesn't, he's not, he doesn't get to say. <laughs> right. So you had said when we talked that you had ended up moving out of state once they uh, were, they, they had the, the supervising agency uh, had, had what, did they refuse service? Oh, okay. So eventually um, amidst all the, TPR case and, and, and upping the restraining orders to 10 years, um, it was also put in there to allow me to um, relocate because he was continuing as a stalking and harassing. He would either do it or have someone else do the stalking for him via media as well as in person. So he had no problem doing that. The state of Wisconsin told me I had to ask his permission to move to be able to relocate. And in that year, it was uh, 2018, Wisconsin State agreed and said that was okay. The other party was going to argue about it, but then decided, okay, to allow us to move to Minnesota. And, um, and I moved to Minnesota. And the, uh, Wisconsin had put the stipulation on that, that if the other party wanted to, they, they could do their supervised visit visits in a facility with high um you know security for my son twice a month and we went from there i had stayed and lived in minnesota i'm familiar with minnesota my family resides there so we lived there and um he had the other party had stipulations of of the supervised visitation it was not considered custody it was considered he had supervised visits i still had sole full legal custody and do you know, do whatever I need to do with that. And then he would also prior to that have to do domestic violence, MRT treatments and report it to the attorneys and, and whatnot to say that he completed those things and continuing the treatment. And he had a 21 day period to do that. And he didn't, there was no record stating that he followed through with any of that. There's nothing that was ever reported to his attorney or my attorney. There was nothing even reported to the state. He also was in charge of the PA case. From my understanding that if you're the one that's interested in seeing your child and you're non-custodial, you're the one that has to bring up the case to whatever county or state you're in and sign a date, sign a court date, start the process. That never happened. Now, was it ordered that he had to do those things before he could have visitation? Yes. Yes. And, so and he legally didn't even have any right to have visitation if he didn't complete those steps yet anyways. Right. Right. Exactly. And actually, if you back in what, 2015, when I started um, speaking out and fighting back and getting the restraining orders, he had the option to voluntarily use his medical insurance to go and do that without being court ordered. And then it became a stipulation in court order for him to do that prior to the TPR case. And he still did not complete that. So it's so crazy. So um, uh, as far as an assessment, so what happened from from there? Did you uh, so nothing was filed then in, in Minnesota? You were back in Minnesota then at that point, right? Yep. Yep. For a couple of years. Mm hmm. And then and so you never saw the kids and, and you never had a court date at all in those two years. Nope. No. So was, was your previous court from Wisconsin that was finalized and closed out? Yeah. They, they signed off jurisdiction. Minnesota was going to be jurisdiction. They said, okay, you know, on, on the paperwork, it says, yep, this is approved to go to Minnesota and that's going to be the, the place of residence. So then uh, a couple of years later, you ended up moving then to Florida, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
yep, and stayed down there for a few years, and life went on. And of course, in the meantime, I I did know that he was trying to harass and terrorize um, very close friends of mine, thirty plus years, you know, lifelong friends, and threaten them and trying to locate us and trying to you know just continue on the harassment. You know, the the thing is, when you report and and respond to those threats. And you know you go to the police to do that. The police's job is to go to the person that's causing the problem, which then, in in my experience or logic, is that once you acknowledge that behavior and they get basically the answer they're looking for by the police contacting them in response to the harassment, then that verifies they know exactly where you are. Right, right. So what is it that that happened then uh, down in Florida? You were falsely accused of of kidnapping your own children whom you had full custody of so in may um i was picked up at one o'clock in the morning i didn't get to say goodbye to my kids they were still sleeping the police came to my door i was still asleep and i had what four or five officers at my door and the county had told me that i had missed a court date in wisconsin now mind you it didn't quite click in it was early in, in the morning and I was still asleep and I just, I couldn't put two and two together right away. And I was really confused. They said, yes, you had a court date that you, that you were supposed to, to meet in, in Wisconsin. And I said, I don't understand. What do you mean? I don't, I don't live there. You know, what is this all about? And this doesn't make any sense. And um, eventually I found out it was the other party that was causing this to happen. So I guess somewhere down the line, he had jumped from Minnesota. He's not a Minnesota resident. He doesn't live in Minnesota. He jumped over the border and went into Wisconsin, complained that he has a missing son and that I'm missing and that I kidnapped all of my children. This means other children that are not even related to him. After being picked up in, in Florida, I sat in the, in the jail down there for what, about three weeks, I think. Florida recognize that this that there was something wrong with this arrest that the arrest should not have happened because i have full custody i have restraining orders five of them against this person which is very rare to have five ten-year restraining orders against somebody they recognized that it was done unlawfully they recognized that it was done under bad faith i attended what three they they call it what first appearances only because I didn't understand what it what was going on. And in those first appearances, you don't get to defend yourself. You don't get to say, hey, I need to go home and take care of this. You don't get to say anything. You just basically stand there and the judge says what your charges that are pending are and could be and ask if this, you know, is your name such and so and just recognize what's going on. So that's all that is. You don't get to say anything else. You don't get to do anything else. So. I went three times because I didn't understand what extradition meant. I didn't understand what waiving your right to extradition meant because in my knowledge, the word waives means no, you're not going to be extradited. And then I was being told contradictive definitions of what that meant. I've never been in jail before. I don't have a criminal history. You know, I they, they held you in custody even though they Florida knew it was unlawful. They had to because it was done out of Wisconsin and they wanted needed Wisconsin's whatever approval, whatever. But eventually um, they connected with an attorney that was on my case with the restraining orders and with the family case. And they contacted her. And I guess that she also had somehow said that it was un done under bad faith and, and unlawfully being done. And I guess Wisconsin disagreed with that. And I guess there were some other processes saying that, that they said that I, I either didn't utilize or, or whatever. I don't know. It was all done underneath me. I have no idea. I have to relook at that. So they basically quashed this warrant and then reissued another one and then decided that I was going to be extradited up there. And so I signed the paperwork thinking that that meant I was going to still stay in Florida so I can take care of my family and do what I need to do and take care of whatever Wisconsin wanted. But it didn't work that way. So I ended up being carted all the way up from, from Florida to Wisconsin. 
sat in Wisconsin jail for about four, I believe four and a half months for a missed court date. That so, is in, in family court. Well, they tried to, yeah, both. <laughs> they tried to do it as a criminal case. And while the criminal pending criminal case, they were, they started adding things in there like interference of custody, interference of custody of other parent, and then um, disobey order. They were trying to charge him with all of those. And that's 12 years each. So what was the official paperwork that, that your ex filed? Was he what requesting visitation or requesting like what was his excuse because he didn't even complete the steps from from what was done before he never even completed any of those steps so there i mean what what was his grounds to try to haul you to court again you know he he was claiming that we were, we were missing i guess it could be because he wanted to see him supposedly i really don't think it's that because he had not stopped his stalking behaviors that's eight years of stalking. And then on top of even in the relationship, he was still stalking another person he had a restraining order on. I didn't put two to two together. I thought maybe he had PTSD. She claimed, you know, she treated him so badly. I didn't know he had a restraining order on another single mother and her children too. So it's it's really hard to say in the world of, of what we hope for was that it would be for wanting to be an active, productive, safe member to his son but it's really not i really don't think it is for sure so so where does your are you're still dealing with all of this right now correct <laughs> yes yep yep so i ended up in wisconsin jail it took almost three weeks to be issued a what they call a public defender there apparently a long time to to wait to be issued um, an attorney while you're in jail and while waiting for representation there I probably attended about 10 court hearings two two times a week, maybe three times a week for the criminal case. And then on top of that, he started messing with the, the family case and, and, and whatnot, trying to add in contempts and all of this stuff while I was sitting in jail defenseless without any, any way to, to, to do anything or say anything. But eventually I ended up with a public defender and, you know, she was really young and new and I think my case was a bit heavy and a bit complicated to to know exactly what to do. So yeah. he he was trying really hard to take custody of my son, even though he has restraining orders. He and his attorney were trying to to take emergency custody of my son, and they were still trying to claim that we were fleeing and purposely fleeing and purposely hiding and purposely this and that and the other thing. There's a program that's designed to help people who have been victimized and run the risk of being re-victimized by their abusers. And I utilized that. I was told to utilize that and it was a good thing to utilize. But unfortunately, with all this, he was able to violate the laws to go with that and um, find directly where our home address is. That alone on a federal level, the BAWA fought tirelessly to get it so that, you know, when you're a victim of violence, I mean, it's your right to feel safe. And uh, they worked really hard for that. And all these states are just consistently across the board just violating that, putting all of these innocent victims and children in further danger without blinking an eye. Right. And now, and now this program that you were in, it's what, it's comparable and what similar to you're going into hiding like a wit sack almost. A witness protection, which is okay by law to, to use. And the courts know that. Wisconsin knows that. The prosecuting attorney knows that. And he had no problem advertising the address and the other party's attorney had no problem announcing that when she was sworn in not to expose that address to her client. Prosecuting attorney was well aware because the attorneys that were on a, a criminal case made it very clear that he was violating that, but he continued to do it. And he also was had no problem complaining to my attorneys about how unusual this case is and how how much this person is harassing him and all of this stuff. And it's just, he just wants him to knock it off and to go away, but he's still prosecuting me. Right. I mean, God forbid if they, you know, hold the perpetrator accountable. He recognized that it was wrong, but he continued to prosecute me. Right. So I had no bond 
to get out. I met that court, missed court date that I didn't know about. I was never served about this court date that I was supposedly arrested for. But I met that court date. And from my, my understanding, after they get you in there and they have they they force you into that court date that you that you missed, they're supposed to release you that same day. They did not. I didn't have a, a bond. I didn't have any of that for, I think, it was just a few weeks. I didn't have a bond. And then they all of a sudden put a number on a bond for, was it $10,000? And if I were to get bonded out, I'd have to be put on ankle monitoring system. Wow. Uh -huh. That is crazy. Now, did they, uh, eventually, did they end up dropping the charges? No, it's pending. It's still pending to this. So, day. so is is your uh, everything with your custody case still pending as well? But as, as far as the custody case, it's I don't know if you want to call it pending. It's it's really difficult. To, I, it's so confusing. It's very convoluted and, and a mess. I don't even know how to answer that. It's I'm I'm on what they call a diversion program. It's not probation. It's not drug and alcohol related, but I do have to check in via phone calls to talk to a uh, diversion worker or case worker. And they just basically check in to see how you're doing, if you're still around, and if you're not getting into trouble with law enforcement and you're not violating anything. Oh, and know? then they eventually drop it if you are a good girl for their duration that they set forward. Yeah, so basically I am receiving punishment for the abuser stipulations that he didn't follow. That's just ridiculous. I don't. But, you know, they're pending the interference of custody charge. They dropped all the other ones. So you're, you're being charged criminally for interference of custody. And is that what, what you're on, on the mm -hmm. program for? Mm -hmm. So if I'm a good girl for two years, they will drop that as if it never happened. Did this company that that helped you get safe and, you know, put you into hiding, so to speak, did they ever like have are the courts aware of that? And like, did they were they able to defend you at all with, hey, look, she was in this program. Mm -mm. They use that as their as their proof that I was um, hiding. They use it against me. At least the other party uses it against, tries to use it against right, me. Right, right. Yeah. You, you would think that the courts would take a look at that and be like, well, damn, <laughs> this dude messed up so bad they had to go into hiding. Maybe we shouldn't let him around them, you would think. Well, you would think, too, that Wisconsin is no longer jurisdiction. Nobody lives in that state. My family doesn't live in that state. My children and I don't live in that state. They approved in 2018 for me to be somewhere else. I followed the laws in the other state. I didn't right. violate anything. I didn't do anything wrong. So before before you moved to Florida, you were in Minnesota. And then at that point in time, things Minnesota. were closed out of Wisconsin and moved to Minnesota. Mm-hmm. So Wisconsin Extra has no jurisdiction over anything. Right. Well, the issue, the only issue that seems to be is that because the abuser didn't open up this interest in PA case in Minnesota. So that's where I think Wisconsin thinks it's okay for them to to do this and to reopen well, that. No, that's a, actually a federal law. Um, if there's not a current custody case, you would have to go either to the state where custody was last established, okay. or you have to file a case where the the custodial parent and children are living. Mm -hmm. And I'm the custodial parent. But that's how the law is written. That's what you're supposed to do, legally speaking, anyways. That's okay. just crazy to me that West Constance is just like, eh, we're going to step back in and pick this up and just let's start a bunch of shit. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm still not in Wisconsin. I'm not. I mean, things were being domesticated in, in Florida. All of my children's education and, and medical teams and and family and ESA pets and home is there. Right. Now, where does your ex reside? Minnesota. <laughs> I'm just baffled. Hey, what are you doing, Wisconsin? Come on, like get, let's get it together. <laughs> and, yeah, and so in the meantime here, so we have 
the um, other party and his attorney seeking all of this assistance and whatever their plan is through Wisconsin, getting Wisconsin to bark orders for me and my child to do in Minnesota. So what does your attorney say about all of this? Um, I'm finally have an attorney on this now. The criminal attorneys, unfortunately, you know, they're they're only for the criminal aspect of it. And when that diversion program was put on, she's no longer on that once that happens. But as far as like the family attorney that I have found, thankfully, I'm involved with the very good church community. They noticed that this is all wrong. She is definitely taken back by how this has been handled. And we're hoping and believing that once we get it established in the state that I'm in now that the state is going to fight hard and fight back and flatten us out and tell Wisconsin, you know what, you should have never been able to bark orders in a different place that no one lives. Well, somebody needs to stand up and fight for you. That's for sure. Because that's just absolutely ridiculous. If you want to do a lame comparison, that'd be like our neighbor who doesn't even know our children telling our children what to do. It just doesn't work. You're not making any sense. You know, I have tried bringing up the facts carefully and the best I could, giving the circumstances and my fears to the family judge about these facts. I mean, they knew that this was out of jurisdiction. The prosecutor knew it was out of jurisdiction. The prosecutor even knew that my children were safe, even the child that's in common with him. And they also know that I was never married to this guy, but they continue to treat it as if this is a marital thing. And it's not. They all knew that we were not in jurisdiction. They all knew, obviously, they're the ones that issued for me to be arrested and know where the jurisdictional home is. And in getting this information from the the abusive party anyways should indicate too to them that obviously he's violating the restraining orders. It's all over me to where he goes. And he's even had um, our location tagged out on media for everyone to see, claiming what he was claiming and and all of these things that aren't true. I I just lose track because there's just so much stuff. So much stuff. I can't even comprehend it myself. I mean, it's an overwhelming experience, you know, as a whole. I mean, even just dealing with, you know, domestic violence and any kind of custody or visitation, that alone is enough to take you down. And then you add in all the criminal stuff that they're trying to throw your way as well. I mean, that's a lot to have to deal with all at once. Right. It doesn't make sense. How is it that they can even sit there, like you said, and like I've been saying to to those that I talk to, they're helping me heal through this. I can't even heal right now because it's still going on. There's no there's no way to heal right now. It just there's no sense into it, period. There isn't. How can I be accused of interference of custody when I have full soul custody? And whether or not there's restraining orders, there's no interference there. He was granted, yes, two supervised a month for an hour and a half. But again, that's not custody. That well, was- the, the place that you went to refused service because oh. of his behavior. Because they recognize that that's unsafe and that's logical. That's very logical because not only are my children be at risk for danger. It would be the whole facility itself if he were to switch moods or personalities or or whatever's going on. He has no filter when he gets in that mode. He doesn't care who the collateral damage is or non-collateral damage. It doesn't matter. I mean, they recognized that in 2018. I even brought the proof to the court and to the judge stating Here's the 2018 emails stating that they cannot support this. By a lot, they can't support this. It's 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 dangerous. Right, right. Yeah, and for I, sure. They, That's just crazy that the courts allow things like that to slide. They they request, you know, specific things to be done and you do those and and they request for evidence and And, you know, and and you give them everything and they're still not good enough. You know, it's like, well, what more do you want? I gave them 93 pages of evidence and and I had filed a de novo case on the family case so I could get my facts and findings there. I didn't know when I was in jail that I needed 
an extra attorney for the family case. I thought, well, this attorney will do it all. Public mm -hmm. defender. I didn't know. So the family case is spiraling out of control and I had no defense for my son and I. They didn't even have a GAL. They suggested there be a GAL, but I guarantee you that the GAL was not going to take it because of how messed oh, up. Oh, no. Gee, if, if a GAL is, is, if it's ordered, it's required and they, the court has to appoint somebody. But that being said, GALs are not what they are made out to be. Uh, and that can actually end up being far more detrimental to your case. Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, they're supposed to be there to help the children. And and uh, and I'm not saying that all guardians are, you know, are like that by any means. But I had that personal run in myself where uh, she was, you know, bribing, coercing, manipulating, and even threatening my child, trying to force her into wanting to communicate with you know her abusive father and does it work that way no you can't force someone to be friends with someone who um does that kind of stuff Honestly, when it's being forced by the court i think they forget that it's it's no different than saying it's okay for someone to go ahead and violate you it just oh. go ahead and set your boundaries and then you're teaching these our children who are supposed to be next in line for our future, we depend on them for what's next out there. We're teaching them that it's okay to violate someone else's boundary because us adults are going to enforce you to do it. That's okay. It doesn't matter. It also teaches kids that their voice doesn't matter either. Or their feelings or emotions, they're completely ignored. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And my biggest concern with this is my son is vulnerable not not just in age he's vulnerable but also to he he has autism he may be super high iq or whatever on the spectrum for iq level but there's still that part of him that does not gauge that wait a second i'm being manipulated or wait a second i'm uncomfortable and i'm here but this guy is giving me a car to play with because cars are my favorite things now i have a connection they're not going to let go of that connection and put two and two together that i was just tricked and still play with the unsafe person it's just not okay he is now in, in those um supervised visits from what i understand it's because the state of minnesota is afraid to violate any court order because they don't want to get in trouble and that's a lot of issues there too it puts them in silence as well mm -hmm. and um and then on top of that they also issue this thing called reunification and i did some studies in, in reading and research on that and i found out there's several states that are now banning that program because of these type of things well so now my son is being exposed which i found out the therapist is just a regular therapist doing this and it's not under high supervised security. So it's just the other person's therapist with the abusive person in the room. Mm. And it's in the office all by herself with my son. So what's the next step when he decides that he's going to go to the next level with my son? You know, and then now my son is going to have to recover from being forced into this therapy, other therapy session that who knows? coercing him to be friends with the person that wanted him gone hurt his siblings hurt his mom took him away from his mom went mm -hmm. from eight full years to mm, i don't know i see him once every other week now that is just crazy it's it's heartbreaking seeing what's being done to survivors all across america i mean and, and it's happening everywhere you would think that by this day and age uh, we would know better. I mean, the government pays for all of these studies and and they have all of these statistics and they do nothing with it. I don't know what hurts worse, the person abusing you by abusing your children or abusing you or or you're set up to believe that the judiciary system or the state is all prepared to protect you. It was set up. I mean, they gave gave us the restraining orders. They said the proof is there and then it's flipped absolutely anytime i see a police police car go by i'm scared they didn't do anything to me they were just doing their job or anytime something comes in the mailbox 
That's that's great. I I don't. There are times it takes me three four days to go to my mailbox. I'm scared of my mailbox. Oh, it it takes me weeks. I feel your pain. <laughs> because what's next? You know, the most recent thing now too with this diversion program, I guess they also added in, so I couldn't get my full bond money back. They gave me half of it, and then they kept the other half and gave me the stipulation, even though there shouldn't be any bond and money to be even had or kept because this is done now and whatnot and I'm released. So there shouldn't be any more of that being held whatsoever. It should all be in my hands. But they decided that they're gonna hold the other half of it until until I find an attorney and that's the only way to for me to get that released is if I have an attorney to release that. Like I just mentioned not too long ago is I do now, I do I did find some representation and we had the whole runaround about getting that money released. The clerk of courts told us one way to do it was, you know, at first they told me I had to be the one to to release it. But then I go and try and do that. And they said, no, the attorney that wants to be on the case has to be the one to write a letter to do it. OK, so the paralegal and the attorney contact them, ask how it's supposed to be done. And they do this whole runaround. Well, there isn't any there isn't any bond money here. What are you talking about? So we go through this whole thing for three months. This attorney was ready to go three months. OK, mind you, this is Social Security money. There's no reason for them to have this. And so all of this goes on. They don't want to take the time to go sift through the whole computer system to find it and and to deal with it well finally they got a hold of it the attorney writes the letter and and whatever the attorney lets me know that okay we got this taken care of well i talked to the diversion worker this is like two weeks ago was it the 21st i talked to him because i had to do a check-in mm -hmm. and he asked me if i received a letter on the 20th i said no what is the letter about well he says it says here from the judge and from the prosecuting attorney that if I don't go into the courthouse and sign my money to be released out, they're going to put me in jail. What? This doesn't make any sense. I Why? said, attorney, <laughs> sign the release. The clerk of court said to do it. And you're telling me I have to come in there. And I had nobody told me that. You're going to threaten me to go to jail for my own money? That's just the most ridiculous thing I've heard. I don't understand. All. I don't understand. Okay, so I made sure I had someone go with me to go to that courthouse because I'm terrified to go in there. I bet. Shoot. I'm not a regular, but I am now. And I just <laughs> need a frequent flyers card. <laughs> Where's my coffee? I'd like a coffee, please. And I'll sit down with you and we could take notes and be friends. <laughs> no, but I just know it's just. It's ridiculous. Why? So it creates all this extra fear again, and it resurfaces everything else, you know, the PTSD and all the memories of what he did to my kids and all everything the courthouse is doing. And I can't breathe. It ruined the rest of my whole entire week. Like five days. I can't sleep. I'm done. You know? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. That's I know that can't be easy to, to rehash. I mean, hopefully the right person sees it that can maybe help you. I mean, I would think that, I mean, your constitutional rights have been violated left and right. I mean, there's got to be a lawsuit, like a I've, serious lawsuit somewhere in there. I've never been able to put my facts to the table in that family case. And when I did, they literally tossed it out because it was 90 pages or 60, 60 or 90 pages long of evidence in the family case. And they based it all on what the other person has said. And then when I try to reword it in a, hopefully in just non-emotional way or whatever, try to redo it in even less pages, then they turn around and say, well, you did a pro se. We can't take it. You did it without an attorney. We can't take it. Well, I was forced in a position where I had to, to represent my son and myself and be the attorney and the witness and everything. I've never done anything like that before. And so they tossed all that effort out. I was scared. I didn't know what I was doing. I was messing up. And then I just had trial and I did it the day after trial, that de novo case. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm tired. I'm not an attorney and I'm doing the best that I can. And I probably said I was tired probably more than a dozen times. And then they ended up saying, we're going to hold you in contempt, contempt, contempt for all this stuff. And on the de novo, they were trying to contempt me for stuff 
that they couldn't go back on. And you can't do that. And, so and again, it, it's in their state. And nobody lives there. I'd like to see what Minnesota is going to do with this because they're going to be like, they can't give orders where no one's at. Right, right. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. The child doesn't live there. I mean, what, what is everybody expected to move back to Wisconsin or what like that? And they also, you know, with this reunification center, it's only seven to eight minutes from his home. That's easy okay. access for him to pull something. Oh, yeah, for sure. And then on top a little of too convenient. Yeah. And then on top of that, I mean, there was a violation with that therapist was CCing him on my emails, knowing that there's those restraining orders. Oh, my Lord. I'd be suing them, too, then. Shoot. Sure. That goes against privacy. And then, you know, obviously, that's more than two times a month if he's doing reunification on top of the other Right, right, man. Well, I would, I'd love to have you on again after you know once this plays out a, a bit more. If you want to come back and and give us an update, I would be honored. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. Great, great. Keep me posted for sure. Make sure you let me know what all is going on with that, and then if you want to come back on, then we can have you on again. All right. Thank awesome. you. We are so welcome. Thank you so much. You. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.